A very good evening aspirants. I have an announcement for you. See, checking your progress and assessing it is as important as studying regularly for the UPSC Civil Services Examination. And well, again, Shankar Ice Academy is going to lend you a hand in this. Yes, Shankar Ice Academy is going to help you in assessing your prelims preparation for 2022 preliminary examination. And for this, Shankar Ice Academy is conducting all India prelims mock test. It is a free mock test. It will be conducted in offline as well as online mode across 13 centers. And note down the dates here. It will be conducted on 15th, 22nd and 29th of May. So I request the viewers to register for the free All India Prelims Mock Test for assessing your preparation. So with this announcement, let us move on to the Hindu News Analysis. Today we will be covering Hindu News Edition dated 17th and 18th of April 2022. So these are the articles I have taken. As you know, yesterday was Sunday and on Sundays we get important science and tech related articles. And that is why I have chosen this particular article that is very relevant in the prelims perspective. In this discussion, we will be discussing about thermophotovoltaics. We will also see few features about thermal batteries. And in the remaining discussions also, facts related to prelims and mains have been covered. In this first discussion, we'll be seeing about satellite phones. And in the second discussion, we'll be talking about the national cyber security strategy. And in this discussion, we'll be seeing about the Sarna religion and the Dukhu tradition. And in this last discussion, we'll be seeing about a code that is drafted for the medical devices. And at the end, I also have a practice quiz question. So pay attention to all these discussions and try to answer the quiz question correctly. Without wasting much time, let us get to the first discussion. So we are going to start our discussion from this news article. According to the article, 15 signatures of Iridium satellite phones have been found in the military hit Kashmir Valley. See, these Iridium satellite phones were used by the US-led Allied forces in Afghanistan and these satellite phones helped the terrorists to escape. So in this discussion, let us see what are these Iridium satellite phones and also the Turaya satellite phone mentioned in the news article. See here, the both Turaya and Iridium are nothing but the satellite phones provided by two different companies. So what is a satellite phone? It is a phone that uses satellites for communication instead of terrestrial lines. That is, it uses satellites for receiving and sending signals. Now, in case of normal cellular phones, which we have in our hands, they actually use terrestrial lines. And these terrestrial lines is a system which facilitates audio, video, data, and any other type of communication within a local geographical area. And note that for such wireless communication, radio waves are used. So here, there will be a transmitter and receiver at the ground level for specific boundary in case of a terrestrial line system. Now, even the satellite phones use radio waves. But in contrast to the cell phone or the mobile phone, these satellite phones work by connecting to a telecommunication satellite in space. Now, we saw that the signals are transmitted and received through satellites which are placed in orbit around the Earth. So, therefore, these phones enable communication anywhere around the world irrespective of the location. But we know that this is not possible in case of normal cell phones because they require proper terrestrial network coverage to enable communication. So, this is how a normal cell phone is different from a satellite phone. Now, if we come to the Turaya satellite phone, so it is a advanced geosynchronous mobile satellite system. Turaya provides access to satellite and GSM services from the same handset. Here GSM stands for Global System for Mobile Communication. This GSM is a globally accepted standard for digital cellular communications. So this is also provided by the Turaya satellite system. And note that the Turaya Mobile Satellite Services is a subsidiary of United Arab Emirates based company. And this is UAE's first homegrown satellite operator. This Turaya also offers the facility for high quality voice calls, voice mails and SMS. It also has an inbuilt GPS. So here Turaya is the different company. Similarly, Iridium is also a company. Here don't confuse it with the Iridium element. The Iridium element is a rare element. And maybe that is why this company is named as Iridium Communications. So the Iridium satellite phone belongs to this company only. And it is a publicly traded American company. Now this satellite phone particularly operates based on a Iridium satellite constellation. This Iridium satellite constellation is a system of 66 active satellites. They are used for worldwide voice and data communication from handheld satellite phones. 
So these are a few points about Iridium and Thuraya satellite phones. Now what about their status in India? See both these phones are banned in India. Actually initially they were restricted. They were restricted after the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. It was restricted by the Director General of Shipping. Here the phones along with the infrastructure was restricted. But in 2012 it was completely banned under the provisions of Indian Telegraph Act. So that means now in India both the satellite phones are banned. Therefore all the foreigners who visit India are advised not to carry such satellite phones into India. Now if anyone has the possession of the satellite phones then they are liable for prosecution. Here their satellite phones will be confiscated and they will also be subjected to penalties under Section 6 of Indian Wireless Act and Section 20 of Indian Telegraph Act. So carrying a satellite phone, especially Thuraya and Iridium satellite phones is a punishable offence in India. So these are the few facts that you have to know about satellite phones in general and about the Iridium and Thuraya satellite phones and their position in India. With these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So our next discussion is going to be based on this text and context article. It talks about the National Cyber Security Strategy NCSS. See in this article three aspects of this strategy have been covered. First is why there is a need for such a strategy. Second the main sectors focused in this strategy and third some of the suggestions given by this NCSS. So let us see all these aspects now. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here so that you can link the syllabus part with our discussion. See actually the article talks about the national cyber security strategy of 2020. What is it? It is a report that was submitted by the Data Security Council of India in short DSCI. This DSCI is a not-for-profit industry body that is focused on data protection in India. Now this body was set up by NASCOM and its main focus is to make cyberspace safe and secure. And this NCSS 2020 has been prepared by Data Security Council of India. Now the main aim of this NCSS is to ensure a safe, secure, trusted, resilient and vibrant cyberspace for India. And note that overall this report focuses on 21 areas. Here are the 21. You can see that it covers from cybercrime investigation to digital payment security to data security and governance. But today let us see few major focus areas only because we cannot cover all of these in one day. Now the first major focus area is the large scale digitization of public services. We all know that almost all governmental functions are rapidly digitized in the past couple of years. Now this rapid digitization has certain challenges due to the risks posed by technology. So the report suggests that instead of focusing on cyber security after the digitization process is complete, the focus must be given on cyber security in the early stages of the design in all digitization initiatives. Plus according to the strategy, if the security is not embedded in the design stage itself, then the digital systems would be vulnerable to cyber attacks. Along with this, it also says that an institutional mechanism must be created for the assessment, evaluation and certification of the core devices that is used for digitization process. So this is what mentioned in the large scale digitization of public services. Now the next focus area is supply chain security. Now here specific focus is given to the supply chain security of integrated circuits and electronic products. Regarding this, the strategy states two things. First is regarding the integrated circuits and electronic products which are manufactured in India. See for these products, product testing and certification needs to be scaled up according to the strategy. And second, it urges for continuous monitoring and mapping of the supply chain for these products which are imported into India. And both these are done to ensure supply chain security. Now the third one that we're going to see is about the critical information infrastructure protection. See here, critical information infrastructure refers to any data, database, network or communications infrastructure whose destruction could cause a huge negative impact on national security, national governance, economy and also which will impact the social well-being of a nation. And we know that recently there has been an increase in cyber attacks by both the state actors and non-state actors in our country. So in this manner, the report also mentions that more focus must be given to the critical information infrastructures. Particularly, as per the strategy, a repository of vulnerabilities have to be maintained. These repositories will help to address the loopholes in the existing critical information infrastructure. So overall, 
Through this, the strategy aims to make the critical information infrastructure as a resilient one, which will enable delivery of services even at the times of cyber attacks. So this was about the CIIs. Now the next one is digital payments. As you know, digitization of payment is the prime driver of digital economy. Now we have digital payment systems like UPI, and nowadays it has been ingrained in our day-to-day -day activities. Therefore, the strategy urges to provide a proper focus in protecting these digital payment systems. According to it, efforts must be made to promote uh, responsible and timely disclosure of vulnerability and incident reporting. This timely reporting of vulnerability will ensure better coordination and harmonization in regulatory initiatives. It will also help in insulating the digital payment infrastructure from any cyber attacks. Now, as a last focus area, let us take the state-level cybersecurity. See, presently, many states in the country are taking concerted efforts for delivering public services on digital channels. So, according to the strategy, efforts must be made to ensure that states are taking cybersecurity on their agenda. And efforts must be made to develop capabilities of the state machinery to address cybersecurity challenges. So, these are few major focus areas of NCSS. Now, along with these focus areas, it also provides certain suggestions. Let us see the important suggestions now. The first suggestion is regarding the budgetary allocation. It suggests that the budgetary allocation must be increased to 1% of the total annual budget. Plus, it also suggests that each ministry must allocate 15 to 20% of the IT or technology expenditure for ensuring cybersecurity. Now, second suggestion is regarding investments. According to it, investments in modernization and digitization of ICTs must be made. Along with this, short-term and long-term agenda for cybersecurity should also be set up. And here, more focus must be given to outcome-based programs. Now, third is regarding the skill building. Here, the report suggests that a national framework should be devised in collaboration with institutions like uh, NSDC and ISEA. NSDC is the National Skill Development Corporation. And ISEA is the Information Security Education and Awareness. Now, this suggestion is to provide global professional certifications in cybersecurity. Along with this, it also has a main suggestion of creating a separate cadre of officers for cybersecurity in lines with the Indian Engineering Services. So, remember, the NCSS of 2020 prepared by the DSCI has suggested for a separate cadre of officers for cybersecurity. Now, the next suggestion is regarding management during a crisis. For this, the report recommends holding cybersecurity drills, which will include real-life scenarios. It even suggests that in critical sectors, simulation exercises for cross-border scenarios must be held. It could be held on an inter-country basis. So, what are simulation exercises? So it is a practice activity that places participants in a simulated situation and this situation will require those participants to function in the same capacity which is expected of them in a real event. So the major purpose behind simulation exercise is to promote preparedness by testing policies and plans, standard operating procedures and the personnel who are training. So overall, simulation exercises will prepare us for the actual crisis. Now the fifth recommendation is regarding creation of cyber insurance. See, cyber insurance is also called cyber liability insurance. It is a contract that an entity can purchase to help reduce the financial risks which are associated with doing a business online. So it is like a normal insurance but for the online activities in the cyberspace. Now this NCSS recommends developing cyber insurance products for critical information infrastructure. The report also mentions that before introducing cyber insurance, proper steps must be taken to quantify the risks involving the cyber security. Then only insurance for those risks can be covered. Now finally, it also suggests for better management of cyber crime investigation. It recommends that the judicial system must be unburdened by creating laws to resolve spamming and fake news. And here it is suggesting to set up exclusive codes that will deal with cybercrime itself. So these are few important recommendations suggested by the National Cyber Security Strategy of 2020. So you can see that many of these recommendations are important and must be implemented. Now I have to tell you one thing here. See this NCSS which you just saw was released by the DSCI as I said in the beginning. 
Now, the government has also formulated the draft National Cyber Security Strategy of 2021. It has been formulated through the National Security Council Secretariat. So, NCSS 2020 is by DACI, whereas the draft NCSS 2021 is prepared by the National Security Council Secretariat. And it is said that this 2021 strategy will look at addressing the national cyberspace security issues and it is in the draft stage. So, as of now, it is not available publicly. So, we can hope that this 2021 strategy will be based on the 2020 strategy as many important suggestions have been provided by the 2020 strategy itself. So, if till the next means the NCSS 2021 is not available publicly, we can use the points from the 2020 strategy itself to enhance our answers related to cyber security. So, these are few points that you have to remember regarding NCSS 2020. Here we saw few of the focus areas in detail. We saw that it is submitted by the Data Security Council of India, which was set up by NASCOM. And its aim is to ensure a safe, secure, trusted, resilient cyberspace for India. Now, it has 21 focus areas. Among them, we saw few. We saw about the large-scale digitization of public services. And the report suggested that cyber security in the early stages of the design must be focused in all digitization initiatives. And it also urges for institutional mechanisms that has to be created for assessment, evaluation and certification of the devices used for digitization process. Then we saw about the uh, supply chain security where we saw about integrated circuits and electronic products. And here the products manufactured in India, their product testing and certification needs to be scaled up in India. And for the imports, Continuous monitoring and mapping of the supply chain must be made according to the strategy. Now, in the critical information structure protection, we saw that a repository of vulnerabilities must be maintained to address the loopholes. And then we saw about the digital payments area. As per the strategy, responsible and timely disclosure of vulnerability and incident reporting is, is necessitated. Then final focus area we saw is about the state level cyber security. This means cyber security should be on the state's agenda and capabilities for that should be maintained by the state machinery. Then after this, we saw the suggestions in the report. First one was regarding budget allocation. It suggested it to be increased to 1% of the total annual budget and 15 to 20% of the IT or technology expenditure of each ministry. Second is uh, investment in the modernization and digitization of ICTs. Then it talked about the skill building where collaboration with institutions was suggested like uh, with the institutions of uh, National Skill Development Corporation and ISCA. It also suggested to create a separate cadre of officers for cyber security. Then it suggested cyber security drills including simulation exercises to prepare us for an actual crisis. Then it suggested the creation of cyber insurance, especially for critical information infrastructure. Then finally, it suggested to set up exclusive codes to deal with cyber crimes. So these were the few important focus areas and suggestions of the National Cyber Security Strategy of 2020 submitted by the DSCI. With these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So this discussion is going to be based on this news article from the front page. It says that a couple got married at a community wedding ceremony in Jharkhand. See, this is in news because this couple belong to Sarna and it should also be noted that before their marriage, they have been living together for decades and they also have three children. That is, they were in a live-in relationship. But now, they have got legally married. So, here we will understand what is Sarna and we will also see how people in Jharkhand are in a live-in relationship. First, let us start with the understanding of Sarna. See, there are many religions, right? In India, we have uh, Hinduism, Christianity, Islamism, Buddhism, Jainism, etc. Similarly, Sarna is also a religion. And the followers of Sarna are usually nature worshippers. That is, their faith relies on Jal, Jungle, Zameen. Here, Jal means water, Jungle means, as you know, forest, and Zameen means land. So, its followers pray to the trees and hills while believing in protecting the forest areas. And you should note that this faith is mostly followed by tribal people. Particularly, it is prevalent in the tribal region of Jharkhand. Now, you may think why we have not heard about this religion before. See, it is because it is not listed in census. Under the census, there are only codes for six religions. That is Hinduism, Islamism, Christianity, Sikhism, Buddhism and Jainism. So, when these tribal people are asked to fill the religion, what they do is they choose the others option. And in this others option, there is no provision to specify their particular religion as a different one. 
Actually, in census surveys during 1871 to 1951, there was a separate category for the tribal population. But later, this separate category was dropped. And from then on, these communities were recognized as scheduled tribes, but they were not recognized as a separate religious group. So remember, Sarna is nothing but a religion and its followers pray to the nature. Here you should remember that the Sarna people have been demanding a separate code for their religion like the other six religions. So now what about the news today? We saw that the couples, they were in a living relationship before they got married. So whether it is a matter of choice for them or not, let us understand that now. So you should know that in India, the concept of living relationship is not new. It existed in the ancient times itself. At that time, it was known as Maitri Karar, in which a written agreement was made between people of two opposite sexes. So after this agreement, they will live together as friends and they will look after each other. And similarly, you all would have heard about the Gandharva marriage, right? It is one of the eight Hindu marriage concepts. And it also has its roots in the concept of living. So in a Gandharva marriage, what happens is a man and a woman meet each other of their own accord. They consent to live together and their relationship is consummated. So on these same lines in the news which we are discussing today here also, women staying with a man in a relationship, bearing their children without getting married, without any social acceptance and legal rights is an Adivasi tradition in Jharkhand. And this tradition is known as Dukhu marriage or Dukhu tradition. And according to the tribal community norms, here the woman is recognized as Dukuni and the man is called as Dukhua. So what is this Dukhu tradition? It is a civil cohabitation and it is approved before and after pregnancy and even after the birth of children. And this tradition is prominent in the tribal dominated rural areas of Jharkhand. Particularly it is dominant among the Munda tribes, Orahun tribes and the Ho tribes. Here you should remember that this Dukhwa tradition or the marriage has been flourishing in patriarchal tribal communities for centuries. So can we say that it is a broad-minded concept? Actually, no. It is because these Dukhu marriages are a social bane for tribals in the Jharkhand. Now, why is this? Mainly because they enter this kind of marriage due to force. See, in their communities, those who want to get married, they have to organize wedding parties. But many of the tribal peoples and tribal couples, they are unable to do it because of the poverty and illiteracy. So they are not allowed by their community, that is by the fellow villagers, to get married without throwing a wedding feast. So here, just because they are not able to follow a tradition, the people are not allowed to get married. And that is why I am saying it is forced and it is not something they do it willingly. Now, particularly... It affects the woman in the relationship. Why? Because here the woman who is called as Dukhni, they are not given the rights of a wife. For example, like in the Hindu tradition, they cannot apply Sindur. You know that in Hindu tradition, even nowadays, many follow the Sindur tradition, whereby they will be applying vermilion on their forehead. This signifies that they are married. But we can say the feminist women in the Hindu religion do not follow this as of now. But there is another issue in this. It is if the husband dies, that is if the partner of the woman dies, then she does not get a part in husband's ancestral property. And even the children who are born out of this relationship are not also socially recognized and accepted. So here you can see they are losing on their rights. Plus here the term Dukhni itself is derogatory to women. It means that the woman has entered a household without marriage. So the term itself is seen as derogatory. So what we can understand is Dukhu marriage is a compulsion and not a choice. And tribals have been following this for centuries because they have been deprived of basic social recognition and due to their poverty. Actually, this is why the community marriages are arranged, which is given in the news. We saw in the beginning that the couple got married in a community wedding ceremony. Now, these community weddings are arranged by NGOs and they are facilitated by district administrations. So that means those who are unable to get married on their own and throw a wedding feast, they get married in such ceremonies. And here the woman will get the right of a wife and thereby the children will also get to be the legal heirs. So in this discussion, we saw what is the Sarna religion and we also saw about a different tradition that is followed by tribal people regarding marriage, which is the Dukhu tradition or Dukhu marriage. And then finally, we also saw what are the issues with this Dukhu marriage. So whenever there is a topic where you are talking about the poverty and its associated issues among the tribal people, you can mention this also because Dukhu marriage is a result of that. So with these key points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So now let us take up this article for discussion. 
It mentions that researchers have achieved a nearly 30% jump in the efficiency of thermophotovoltaic. So what is this thermophotovoltaic? They are a class of power generating systems which convert thermal energy into electrical energy. That is, they convert the photons emitted from a heat source into electricity. But the article mainly talks about thermal batteries. So let us see what are these thermal batteries. Before that, see one of the problems associated with uh, renewable energy production is that electricity production from renewable sources often does not match with the electricity which is demanded. For example, if you take solar energy itself, here you can see that the solar energy production is maximum in the afternoon, but the energy demand is less at noon. On the other hand, when the energy demand is high, that is during the early morning or during the night period, there is no solar power. So there is excess solar energy production in the noons and there is deficit at other times. So how can this problem be addressed? It can be addressed by advancement in electricity storage technologies. And one among the electricity storage technologies is the thermal batteries. Now, how does a thermal battery function? See, it uses latent heat to store energy. And this involves two processes. First, here the electric energy is used to melt the low cost metals such as silicon or ferrosilicon alloys. Here, mostly excess electricity produced by renewable sources is used to melt silicon or ferrosilicon alloys. But why these elements are used? First, because they are low cost and second, they have huge latent heat. Now, what is this latent heat which I am saying again and again? Latent heat is the energy that is absorbed or released by a substance during a change in its physical state. And this physical state occurs without changing its temperature. For example, if you are heating silicon, its temperature rises initially. While the temperature of silicon rises, it still remains solid. But when the temperature of the silicon reaches its melting point, here the phase change occurs. That is here the silicon starts melting. Now when this melting process happens, the temperature remains constant. So here the amount of thermal energy which is required to completely melt silicon is called the latent heat of melting. See this is where the latent heat is there. Now. Here this whole pink will represent the amount of heat and temperature required to melt that object. But this constant temperature where there is physical change of state, this is what is called as latent heat. Now similarly, here we will have the latent heat of vaporization. So this is the basic that you need to know about latent heat. Now as I already said, the latent heat of silicon is very high. It is said that a liter of silicon material is able to store more than 1 kilowatt hour of latent heat. So when there is excess power production from renewable sources, it is used to melt silicon. And here the excess electricity is stored as thermal energy in the form of molten silicon. Now once this molten silicon starts glowing like this and starts emitting photons like the one in the picture, these photons are captured by a photovoltaic cell to produce electricity. So basically, in a normal lithium ion battery, electricity is stored in the form of chemical energy. But in a thermophotovoltaic battery, electrical energy is stored in the form of a thermal energy. Now, although this method of electricity storage is cheaper than lithium ion batteries, the efficiency of storage is low. Now here only the new discovery comes into light. According to the article, there is a nearly 30% jump in the efficiency of thermophotovoltaic and this is a welcome news in the battery technology. So these are the points that you need to know about thermophotovoltaic and thermal batteries. Now actually what is the difference between normal solar cells and a thermophotovoltaic cell? The main difference is the source of photons here. In case of solar cells, the main source of photons is the sun's solar energy. But in case of thermophotovoltaic cell, as we saw, the photon source is a molten metal. We saw in the example, the metal could be silicon or a ferrosilicon alloy. There is also another difference, which is the solar cells are used to produce electricity, but the thermophotovoltaic cells are mainly used in thermal batteries. So that is all. In this discussion, we saw what is a thermophotovoltaic and we saw about the thermal batteries, how it functions and what is the use of a latent heat there. And finally, we saw the difference between a normal solar cell and a thermophotovoltaic cell. With these points in mind, now let us get to the next discussion. So this discussion is going to be based on this news article. It says that the Department of Pharmaceuticals has recently published the draft uniform code for medical device marketing practices. 
So today we are going to see what this code is about. So as the name suggests, it is about the medical devices. As you know, medical devices sector in India is an essential and integral constituent of Indian healthcare sector. Particularly, these medical devices are required for the prevention, diagnosis, treatment and management of medical conditions, diseases, illness and disabilities. Therefore, these medical devices form an important pillar in the health delivery system along with the healthcare providers, pharmaceuticals, health insurance industry, etc. But then why don't we have a code for this as of now? See, as of now, the marketing practices of the medical devices sector is voluntarily regulated by another code. This code is the Uniform Code for Pharmaceutical Marketing Practices. So remember, as of now, medical devices as well as the pharmaceuticals, they come under the pharmaceuticals code. But now the department has prepared a separate code for medical devices. And this is a draft code only. Final code will be published after getting comments from the stakeholders. Let us see few facts regarding this code now. First is, this code is a voluntary code. It is voluntary for the Indian medical device industry and therefore its implementation will be reviewed after a period of six months. Why? Because if it is found that even though it is voluntary, it has not been implemented effectively, then the government may consider it making a statutory code. Then it will become compulsory. Here you should remember that medical devices is defined under Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940 and the medical device rules of 2017. Now coming to the important provisions of the code, see majorly, first it defines the healthcare professional. See the code that is existing now, which is the code for pharmaceuticals, it does not define who is a healthcare professional. But this new code on medical devices has defined it. According to it, any person or entity who is authorized or licensed to provide healthcare services is a healthcare professional. It also includes those persons who is involved in the decision to purchase, prescribe, order, use and recommend a medical device in India. Further, the definition also extends to two other important entities. One is the individual clinicians. Individual clinicians will include physicians, nurses, technicians, pharmacists, pathologists, lab technicians, etc. And it also extends to the provider entities. That is, it extends to hospitals, pathology labs, blood banks, etc. And along with them, it also covers the administrative personnel such as the hospital purchasing agents under the definition of healthcare professional. So we can see that it has a wide definition. It almost includes everyone who is involved in the healthcare sector. Apart from this, the code also has general information and guidelines about certain things like it has information about the product information, then comparison of medical devices. It also provides guidelines on the advertisements and promotional material. Here the advertisements could include uh, both the textual and audiovisual advertisements and promotional materials. It also defines the company's medical device representatives and the set of standards that are to be followed by them. Mainly it talks about the gifts. So here gifts would include uh, pecuniary advantages and benefits in kind. These shall not be supplied, offered or promised to persons under this code. See here these persons will include those who are qualified to use, prescribe or supply medical devices. So from whom they shall not receive these gifts, they shall not receive it from a medical device company or any of its agents that is like distributors, wholesalers, retailers. So we can say that this directly means they cannot get a bribe to sell or use that particular medical device. But at the same time, here the companies may occasionally provide modest appropriate educational items to the healthcare professionals and such educational items should be the ones that benefit patients or it should serve as a genuine educational function for healthcare professionals. So here the educational items could include like you know the product manuals etc and it could also include medical educational materials like ebooks and subscription to online portals. These can be provided for the benefits of patients and for uh, educational purpose of the healthcare professionals. But other than this any other gifts or benefits in kind shall not be supplied by the medical devices company or any of their agents. Apart from this, the code also prescribes the procedure for lodging complaint and the procedure for handling a complaint. So it provides for a grievance redressal procedure also. And finally, it also provides a self-declaration procedure. See, according to the code, managing directors or the CEOs or the authorized signatory of the medical device company is ultimately responsible for ensuring the adherence to this code and therefore they will show this adherence through a self-declaration. So these are the few provisions from this uh, uniform code for medical device marketing practices.
Now, once this draft is finalized, we may see some other pro important provisions. But as of now, just know that there is already a code for pharmaceutical marketing practices. And now a separate code is being drafted for medical device marketing practices. So with this news article, we have come to the end of this session. Now we are moving to the next session, which is practice questions discussion. Let us take up the first question. It is a two statement question. Let me read out these statements. Satellite phones are permitted with specific permission or no objection certificate from Department of Telecommunications. Now, the second statement is the use of Iridium and Thuraya satellite phones and infrastructure is banned in India. Now, during discussion, we saw that the second statement is right. It is banned in India. But are all the satellite phones banned in India? Actually not. Visitors and tourists who are traveling to India are advised to comply with Indian laws and they are advised not to bring in or use satellite phones in India without obtaining specific permission from the concerned authorities. So that means satellite phones can be used in India with prior permission. And here we are talking about the satellite phones like uh, Inmarsat based uh, satellite services are permitted within territories and areas under Indian jurisdiction. But Iridium satellite phone and Thuraya satellite phones are banned in India. Remember that. And here the question asks for the incorrect statements. Statement 2 is correct and statement 1 is also correct. So here we do not have any incorrect statements. That is why the correct answer to this question is option D neither 1 nor 2. Now let us take up this next question. It is a three statement question based on solar photovoltaic cells. Now the first statement is in photovoltaic cells, sun's heat energy is converted into electricity. Now this statement is incorrect. Read the statement carefully. It says sun's heat energy. No, in photovoltaic cells, the light energy from the sun, that is the photon from the sun is converted into electricity, not the heat energy from the sun. Only in the solar thermal mode of power production, sun's heat energy is used to produce electricity. So first statement is incorrect. Now here question asks for the incorrect statements. So one is in the option. Now the second statement, the photovoltaic cell generates alternating current. This statement is also incorrect. Because the output from the solar photovoltaic cell is direct current and not the alternating current. Whereas in the case of solar thermal mode of power production, the output is alternating current. So remember this fact also. So now the correct answer could be option B and C. We can eliminate A and D. Let us come to the third statement. In the world, maximum solar voltaic power potential is in the equatorial region. This is incorrect. Why? Because the potential is high not in the equatorial region but in the tropical region. So that means this statement is also incorrect and since the question asks for the incorrect statements the correct answer is option C all of the above. Now with these two practice problems questions let me come to the quiz question. This question is based on the Duku tradition. Read the questions carefully and see whether the question asks for the correct statements or incorrect statements. Then arrive at the correct answer. You can post the correct answer in the comment section along with the reasons as to why a statement is right or incorrect. Then I'll tell you whether your answer is right or not. Now let us move on to the mains question. This is the mains practice question for today. Interested aspirants can write answers to this question in the comment section. So with this, we have come to the end of Hindi News Analysis for today. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And also subscribe to our Shankarais Academy YouTube channel for receiving regular updates. Thank you.